stop for candidates on the campaign trail, but a rural Georgia community could prove to play a big role in the election results. COVID cases surging across the country as winter rolls through. Temperatures are dropping and that changes much. It's also putting new items in demand here in Georgia. Civil rights attorneys accuse the city of Atlanta of delaying justice in nearly two dozen police brutality cases. They argue Atlanta is one of the largest U.S. cities that does not ensure that its officers uh, leading to long court battles. And if settlements are reached, taxpayers are left paying the bill. Here's Joe Hankey with more. Outside Atlanta City Hall, civil rights attorneys gathered this morning representing dozens of victims from police brutality cases with pending civil lawsuits. And what we've seen is city council members marching in protest. We've seen elected officials coming to funerals, but what we have not seen is justice for these clients. The attorneys say in cases such as the death of Kane Rogers in 2016, the city of Atlanta fired Officer James Burns for shooting Rogers, but it has delayed a civil lawsuit. The attorneys argue the problem is the city does not have insurance covering officers to cover large settlements. A city spokesman in response sent 11 Alive a statement reading, for the past several decades, the city has been self-insured, including the city's vehicles. If the city used private insurance coverage, it is doubtful that coverage would include police officers who have acted outside of city policies. City employees, including police officers, are represented by the city if they are sued as a result of actions taken in the course of their employment. Recently, the city of Louisville agreed to pay Breonna Taylor's family $12 million for her death following a botched police raid in March involving Louisville officers. A lot of cities now after George Floyd are trying to push to insure their officers and have liability coverage. How are we not leading that charge? In 2016, 92-year-old Katherine Johnston was shot and killed when Atlanta officers mistakenly served a no-knock warrant at her home. Her family's attorneys say after four years, they reached a nearly $5 million settlement with the city, and then they waited. That settlement came out of the, the taxpayers' money. They didn't have insurance. They had to pay me over time because we don't have that, we don't have a place for that. And the attorneys who spoke today said if the city started paying for private insurance to cover the actions of officers, it would not have any impact on pending lawsuits, but they want to make sure a better system is in place for any incidents in the future. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We are closely watching Hurricane Zeta in the Caribbean. Now, it's still really far down to the south. Here we are in Atlanta. Here's the storm. This is nearing the Yucatan Peninsula. Right now, the latest on this is that it's just about 45 miles east of Cozumel, Mexico. It's going to move inland during the late night hours tonight and overnight, crossing over the Yucatan Peninsula. Then it emerges back out over the water in the Gulf of Mexico to strengthen a little bit more. Here's the latest on the storm. This is from the 8th. PM intermediate advisory 80 mile an hour winds moving northwest at 12 miles an hour. You can see it crosses over land, but it still maintains hurricane strength. It'll be at 75 miles an hour Tuesday afternoon, continuing to move northward, coming up to 80 miles an hour Wednesday afternoon, just to the south of Louisiana. We think we'll see a landfall in Louisiana later on Wednesday, and then it becomes a tropical storm inland here overnight Wednesday into early Thursday. And then this is the part we need to watch here from a tropical storm to a tropical depression Thursday afternoon on this track as it's moving tor toward us. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to see the rain increasing, the potential for storms around, as well as some gusty winds moving into our area uh, throughout the day, uh, late Wednesday night and into early Thursday. And then it quickly moves up to the north by Friday afternoon. It's to the east of Boston. So a, a storm that we really have to watch closely. We do have some advisories out already. A flash flood watch has been issued. We'll break that down for you, talk about the severe weather threat, and give you a little better idea of how much wind we can see from this system as it rolls through. Chris, thank you. This is the last week of early voting. Election Day is next Tuesday, and we have already seen record turnout. This year, voters are prepared, and they are motivated. Nationwide, 58 million people have already cast their ballots. NBC News reporting that's 8 million more than the total number of early votes in 2016. And we could hit nearly 100 million votes nationwide before next Tuesday. We're also breaking records here in Georgia. As of 5 p.m. today, more than 2.8 million people have voted, most of those in person. Now, Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger anticipates hundreds of thousands of more ballots will be cast this week before early voting ends. He told voters to expect longer lines, particularly as the week winds down. But he also urged voters 
to trust that his office is doing everything it can to protect your vote and to get a jump on counting results. They're also doing the adjudication as you're moving through the absentee ballot count. So if there's some ballots that kick out because people didn't mark them properly, they're adjudicating those right now so we'll have a relatively timely result and get you those results a lot sooner than many other states. Secretary Raffensperger says right now all 159 counties are scanning absentee ballots ahead of time to streamline the counting process once the polls close on Election Day. As of this evening, the state has seen a 649 percent increase in the number of absentee ballots cast compared to 2016, largely due to the pandemic. The election is just eight days away, but remember, with so many absentee ballots to count, we likely will not know who the winners are officially for a few more days after that. But our 11 Alive voter access team dedicated to answering your questions and concerns throughout the entire process. There are several ways that you can reach us. Send us an email at whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com. You can also text us at 404-885-7600. With just over a week to go, the presidential candidates are busy along the campaign trail. Polls are now showing that Georgia is in play, and it's getting a lot of attention from both Republicans and Democrats. Dr. Jill Biden today was in Macon and Savannah stumping for her husband. Former Vice President Joe Biden, she was rallying people, particularly women, to try to vote Democratic. Now, tomorrow, former Vice President Joe Biden will make his own swing through Georgia with stops in Metro Atlanta and in Warm Springs. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more on what we can expect. Joe Biden will be the first Democratic presidential contender to visit Georgia during a fall campaign since Bill Clinton who was also the last Democrat to win Georgia's electoral vote. Warm Springs is one of Georgia's most historic sites because of the Roosevelt Warm Springs Institute for Rehabilitation. Franklin Roosevelt founded it 95 years ago after he was diagnosed with polio. Roosevelt was elected president seven years later and died at his cottage at Warm Springs after he'd been elected to a fourth term. Democrats think the symbolism of a Biden visit to Warm Springs is important as America deals with its largest ever public health crisis and what many might describe as its unhealthy political divisions. His visit to Warm Springs is incredibly symbolic. Um, you know, Warm Springs is the place known for its restorative and healing powers. I think we're at a moment in time where the nation is desperately in need of healing. Bob Trammell is a Democratic state representative who is in the fight of his political life in a Georgia House district that's just north of Warm Springs. Yet Biden's visit also has a hard-nosed partisan quality to it. Tonight on 11 Alive News at 6. Since July, Georgia has been a frequent stop for candidates in the presidential race. President Trump visited our state three times. Uh, VP Mike Pence has been here once. As Doug mentioned, Joe Biden will make his first trip here tomorrow while his running mate, Senator Kamala Harris. From California, just here over the past uh, week end, and uh, that is on top of visits from family members on both sides. Threatened, beaten, and dragged from her car. A fourth victim now speaking about a terrifying attack by a serial robber targeting drivers in Metro Atlanta. Don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. We have more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. Information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing. Four attacks on four separate drivers, and police believe one man is behind them all. Investigators in Atlanta and Sandy Springs were already looking into three incidents, and now a fourth victim has come forward. She tells our Hope Ford about a terrifying struggle that ended with her being punched and dragged from her car, all while trying to protect her older mother. It was October 9th, just after 4 p.m., outside the dump of furniture store in Buckhead. A woman who wanted to remain anonymous sat in her car near the entrance when a man opened the back door. He climbed in the car, shut the door, and I just knew right then and there, oh, oh my God. The attacker screamed for her to drive off, threatening to kill her, but the victim fought back, mainly concerned over her passenger, her 76-year-old mother. My voice was shaky, and I was like, this is my mother. Then he grabs me, starts pulling me over the center console. My mom starts hitting him on the back to let me go. A struggle continues until the attacker throws a right hook into my left eye, just goes, Boom. The victim was pulled from the car as the attacker drove off. Her car was eventually found days later at the Summit Condos in Sandy Springs. Police also say the man attacked a driver there, forcing another victim to drive him to an ATM. In total, at least four robberies, kidnappings, and carjackings are linked to this man, with three victims being forced to drive him to an ATM. The victim we talked to actually considers herself lucky because she was thrown from the car. I cannot imagine how these women feel about about to be driving this guy around and feeling scared to death for minutes upon minutes. The victim tells Hope it took almost two weeks to locate her car at a tow yard, replace her credit cards and retrieve her license. She also says items found in her car could belong to the attacker. She is handing those over to police. A Crime Stoppers reward now of $2,000 being offered for information leading to the suspect's arrest. Atlanta police tell us this is urgent. They want this man off the street before he strikes again. This man is allegedly connected to four different attacks as marked on this map. They are now being investigated by APD and one by Sandy Springs police. Another victim, Robin, told us last week she was leaving a hair salon uh, in the area not far from the dump when this man jumped in her car, threatened her with a gun, forced her to drive to an ATM to withdraw cash. Robin told us all she could do was to try to talk to him. And I told him, you know, I've just been through breast cancer and he, I'm so sorry, are you okay now? I mean, he was a nice guy. The surveillance video and sketch is all police have to go right now. If you want to take a closer look, you can download the 11 Alive News app and look for the story in the As Seen on TV section. Well, we are enjoying cloudy skies out there right now, and I'm saying enjoying because really the next couple of days are going to be the best days that we're going to have over the next few uh, because we really have to watch what's going on with Hurricane Zeta, and we'll be getting some of the impacts of that beginning Wednesday and then mainly during the first part of the day on Thursday is we're going to be feeling more of the impacts from the remnants of Zeta, which will most likely be a tropical depression as it moves through. Right now, we're dealing with just a good coverage of clouds around, not really any rain. There might be a couple little spots with some mist and drizzle, but no real active rain coming down right now. It is active, though, in the Caribbean. This is where we have Zeta. Uh, this storm is a hurricane. Maximum sustained winds at 80 miles an hour. It's just 45 miles to the east of Cozumel here in Mexico. And remember, Cancun and Cozumel already got hit earlier this year with a storm. Now another one is coming through. It's going to cross over the Yucatan Peninsula here uh, overnight tonight and then tomorrow emerging back over water in the Gulf of Mexico as a hurricane with 75 mile an hour winds. It does come back to 80 mile an hour winds once we get into uh, through the day on Wednesday. Just south of Louisiana Wednesday afternoon, we think we'll have a landfall in the evening hours Wednesday and then it becomes a tropical storm overnight Wednesday to about 2 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. And then we have to watch the track from here in southern Mississippi to here as it crosses through northwest Georgia during the day on Thursday. 
still a tropical depression here moving out of north uh, east Georgia into the Carolinas and then quickly moving up just to the east of Boston by Friday afternoon. So this is the track of the storm and it's going to be a fast mover. That's a good thing because it's not going to linger around for a while. But we are going to have some impacts. I mentioned earlier we have a flash flood watch that's going to be in effect. That's the only advisory we have as of right now. Uh, this is from 8, 8 o'clock in the morning Wednesday through Thursday at 8 in the afternoon. We could have 2 to 3 inches of rain. And then we're also watching the severe weather threat. We don't have the outlook yet for Thursday, but this is the outlook for Wednesday, which shows that severe weather threat in parts of Alabama, Mississippi, and the Florida Panhandle. Into Thursday, this is most likely going to follow that low, and I would expect we would have a, at least a marginal risk here here on Thursday, but we'll let you know more about that tomorrow. Here is the uh, the wasometer for tomorrow. We're going to go with an 8. Uh, that's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, a low of 61 and a high of 78 degrees. Here is the track of the storm, as you can see it, over the Yucatan Peninsula, moving through the Gulf. Okay, so watch here in Atlanta. This is Wednesday. The storm's still well down in the Gulf. However, as it starts moving up this way, we're going to see our rain chances increasing on Wednesday. Not necessarily really outer bands or anything, but just a lot of moisture moving our way. Here we are Thursday morning, the storm down to the south, and then watch as it quickly moves to the north, that's where we're going to see some of that heaviest rain throughout the morning hours Thursday into the early afternoon with that wind threat, storm threat as well, heavy rain threat too. Now, the good news is it's going to move out quickly, so we don't think this rain is going to linger forever. We'll begin to dry out by the end of the week and also cool off for the end of the week heading into the weekend too. So here's the seven-day outlook, mostly cloudy tomorrow, not really worried about any rain here tomorrow, a high of 78. And then the rain moves in on Wednesday, highs near 73. Uh, the biggest impact we'll see from Zeta will be early on Thursday with rain and storms, 77 for a high. After the tropical moisture moves out, a cold front is going to also sweep through, kind of pushing the tropical system out of here. That'll clear us out for the end of the week and the weekend, cooling us off with highs only in the 60s, lows in the 40s Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and then low rain chances coming back on Sunday and Monday. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The American Cancer Society is recommending that women ages 45 to 54 get mammograms every year, but if you have had one, it hurts. Some women say the discomfort is too much. Research is showing the pain keeps 75% of women away from returning for a second mammogram. And now there is brand new, a, a painless machine for breast cancer scan, uh, screenings, and here's a look. Dr. Gerald Grubbs calls the 3D breast imaging machine the most compassionate way to screen for breast cancer. Women are so much tougher than guys. It, it just amazes me. Dr. Grubbs says with mammograms, the combination of dense breast tissue and compression can lead to inaccuracies and pain. So what happens a lot of the time is that you get pseudo lesions. It looks like there's a mass in there. So then they have to come back and have additional views done. It's very uncomfortable. The number one reason why women don't go back to get their follow-up breast Imaging done. The 3D isotropic machine eliminates the follow up. Who doesn't like a BOGO? It's like getting two for one. It's like getting your screening exam and then also getting your diagnostic exam. You're never going to have to have a call back. If you're coming back to see us, it's because you need to have a biopsy. And unlike traditional breast biopsies, Dr. Grubb says women will be sedated. I can't imagine a woman could stay awake and do that. Well, you can see from the table in there that puts you in a natural prone position. Just like in the screening, a woman's breast goes right in this center hole, and Dr. Grubbs goes underneath the surface to perform a biopsy. There's nothing unpleasant about the experience. For screening mammograms, they typically take about 30 minutes to do. You are in and out of this room in barely over five minutes. Dr. Grubbs says there's never been a better time to introduce this life-saving technology, not just during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but during the pandemic. Since the COVID pandemic started in January, breast imaging is down 95%. As soon as I heard about it, I go, this is the niche. This is what I'm looking for. The 3D imaging costs less than a traditional mammogram, and it's covered by insurance. There are only about three of those machines in the United States, one in Sarasota, another in Rochester, and one in Knoxville. Giving Moon River more meaning. Today, NASA scientists revealed there's more water on the moon than previously thought. Moon River, of course, for those of you under the age of 35, a Henry Mancini tune from the early 60s. Scientists knew there was water in the cold, shadowed spots, but a new telescope revealed water in bright, sunny areas as well. The telescope flies above the Earth on a modified Boeing 747 known as SOFIA. But before you get too excited, a little bit of perspective here. The Sahara Desert has 100 times more water than SOFIA found in the soil 
of the moon. Local businesses already adapting to operate during the pandemic, now forced to figure out how to do it a cut above. See the steps one local salon or owner is taking now. Interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. The U.S. hit a harrowing record on Friday with more than 80,000 new COVID-19 cases. That is the highest single-day leap since the country's peak in July. According to the CDC, Georgia now ranking fifth for total coronavirus cases in the country. Today, the Department of Public Health and the numbers show that there were 958 new cases reported while testing remains low. The state's peak was also in mid-July. More than 4,800 cases were reported in a single day. Today, there were 18 new deaths reported. This is below our 14-day average. As August 22nd, the highest single day for deaths with more than 120 reported. With cooler weather comes a new challenge for businesses trying to stay open through the pandemic. Tracy Amick Pierre talked to a Midtown Hair Salon owner about how he is figuring it all out. You've got staff that don't know what to do. After 33 years in business, all of your stock, your color, your inventory. Steve got... Hightower says this pandemic has been the biggest challenge of his career, closing down the Steve Hightower hair salon and day spa on Lindbergh Way for more than six weeks. Rent goes on, everything else goes on. I did apply for the PPP loan, mm -hmm. but it came three weeks after I reopened. So I actually sent it back. Hightower says his clients range from six years old to 95. I specialize in fine thinning hair. I work with a lot of clients that have chemo. Presenting another challenge, how to make clients feel safe coming in. So three months ago, he changed his outdoor deck into an outdoor extension of his salon. Right now, pretty much they're coming outside and they're loving it. So it's like, in the fall, we're going to have it heated, and so they're going to continue to come. But Hightower says he ran into yet another challenge when he tried to buy outdoor heaters. Heater is the new toilet paper. I called every Home Depot in the city, every Lowe's. No one had one. 
I called Sam's. They had 16. I literally got in my car and drove there. By the time I got there, they only had one left. <laughs> so now they'll wrap plastic around the back deck, letting air get through while making the most of the heater they have. Hightower says every new challenge takes some new ideas and a lot of faith. I pray every day to watch over us, to watch over my clients, my staff, mm -hmm. and we'll get through this. It's going to take a while. Hightower says business now is less than half of what it was last year at this time, and he doesn't expect that to increase until next spring. He just hopes they can stay afloat until that time. We certainly have talked how things have changed from the way we work or how we spend our money, and right now some stores are preparing for a possible second wave of pandemic shopping. Remember seeing grocery shelves like these. Things have calmed down since the beginning of the pandemic, but experts are concerned people might rush to stock up again as COVID cases surge and fear over unrest around the election grows. And while many Americans are still concerned about the economy, data from the Lending Tree shows we're actually spending more the grocery store. Average spending groceries, uh, weekly spending groceries, increased by 17% since pre-pandemic times. Something else flying off store shelves, board games. So many families stuck at home. Sales of classics like Monopoly are soaring. Hasbro reports a 21% jump in gaming sales since the pandemic began. Coming up next, waging a war against misinformation. The impact one fake claim is having on Georgia voters. Live to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted. Call it what you want, but the information is wrong. Out and out lies, voters across the country are being hit with a wave of disinformation. The goal is manipulating the election, either persuading people's vote or making them too scared to vote. Social media feeds are flooded 
with all kinds of false claims. And this month, Twitter banned dozens of accounts of users pretending to be black supporters of President Trump. NBC reports there were profiles created using stock images of black people to spread misleading information. Cybersecurity experts say that black and Latino voters are being targeted with digital information to sway their decisions or to keep them away from voting. Now, one of the most common false claims is about security of absentee ballots. According to NBC, since January, almost a quarter of the 13 million mentions of vote by mail or on social media included misinformation. In Georgia, a new survey, USA Poll, showing that 86 percent of registered voters have seen claims that mail-in ballots will lead to an increase in voter fraud. Forty-two percent believe it's true, even though some states have used mail-in ballots for many years with little or no issues. When Georgians were asked where they have seen this fake claim about voter fraud most often, 61 percent said, well, it occurred on Facebook. A distant second is YouTube followed by Twitter, and that goes to show that you can't believe everything you see, and that certainly is shared on the Internet. Political analysts point to Georgia as a battleground state in this year's presidential election. The polls indica indicate a close race here between President Trump and former Vice President Biden, both candidates focusing a lot of energy on Georgia. Here is our Why Guy. The song is a classic. This year, it's the candidates for president who were singing Georgia on my mind. The campaigns have spent in excess of $10 million in advertising in this state, far more than the amount spent here in 2016. Georgia is more important this time around because the race looks uh, competitive. Let's explore the reasons why Georgia is considered a battleground state in this year's presidential election. Georgia has sided with the Republican candidate for president in every election since 1992. George Bush carried the state by 16 percentage points in 2004. Donald Trump's 2016 victory margin was about 5 percent. The trends are moving towards Democrats. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that this year they triumph, but uh, it, it gives Democrats encouragement. Public opinion polls have shown a tight race in Georgia. What we're expecting is, is that this race is going to be decided, you know, by, you know, a few hundred thousand votes uh, at best, if not less. The Electoral College will ultimately decide the race. Georgia has 16 electors, more than all but seven other states. Republicans for the last couple of decades have relied on uh, Georgia providing 16 electoral college votes. To lose that uh, would be a blow. Since Bill Clinton took the state in 1992, the closest a Democrat has come to winning Georgia was Clinton four years later, when Republican Bob Dole's margin of victory here was less than 2%. Have a question for Jerry Carnes or why guys send it to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email. We will continue to watch Zeta very closely as it is a hurricane down in the Caribbean and it's nearing land right now over near the Yucatan Peninsula near Cozumel. It's going to cross over land and then go into the Gulf of Mexico and eventually we're going to see another landfall uh, uh, during the day on Wednesday around the Gulf Coast region. I want to give you this update here on the advisories that we have in effect. There's a tropical storm watch here in the you know central coast of uh, Louisiana. And then right here where you see the pinkish color, that's a hurricane watch that includes New Orleans and the Mississippi coastline. And then another tropical storm watch for the coast of Alabama on up to around the Destin area. The only advisories that we have now in our area when we're, we're going to watch the remnants move our way, this is a flash flood watch that's in effect. We know we're going to get some good rain out of this, most likely two to three inches. The good news is the system's going to be moving very quickly, so it's not going to linger around and just rain on us for days. We're just going to have some bouts of heavy rain from late Wednesday in through the day on Thursday. In fact, this is in effect Wednesday morning through Thursday evening for North Georgia, Metro Atlanta, and areas to the south and west of us, as we mentioned, two to three inches of rain and some higher amounts. We're also going to be talking about some gusty winds in here as this system is most likely going to still be a tropical depression as it moves through northwest Georgia. Stay with us. We're going to break down our wind threats, the rain threat, as well as the potential for strong storms with the passage of this, uh, the remnants of this tropical system. We'll talk more about that coming up.
All right, Chris, thank you. COVID-19 cases are surging again across the United States, and for the first time, the virus is spreading through rural communities, while public health officials worry about falling temperatures driving more people indoors. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. This morning, the COVID crisis, after shattering its single-day record of new infections, is now in its third wave nationally, and it's ravaging many smaller communities for the first time. I think there's an increasingly high level of fatigue, Abe, especially in the rural parts of the country, because we were told back in May and June how bad it was going to be, and it never came. Well, now it's here. In South Dakota, the mayor of Sioux Falls is pleading with residents to wear masks, but the governor says it should be a choice, tweeting if folks want to wear a mask, they are free to do so. Those who don't want to wear a mask shouldn't be shamed into it. Still, COVID cases in 43 states and D.C. are up at least 10 percent in the last two weeks, including record numbers in Illinois, which has topped 9,500 deaths. Excuse me, please. It weighs heavily on the state's health director. These are mothers and fathers and grandparents, co-workers. It's 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 overwhelming. More heartbreak at the University of Dayton in Ohio, where freshman Michael Lang died of complications from COVID-19. Our kid is in a better place, and, you know, he'll be looking down on us, so. But he's 18. He's way too young. Way too young. Wow. Politicians and social media both known for making bold statements about coronavirus, throwing out some shocking numbers as part of our commitment to bring you facts, not fear. Our Verify team looks into a recent claim about the virus impact on black Americans. Verify is your trusted source for facts during this election season. Let's look into this claim from vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris. One in 1,000. That's the number of black Americans that have died. Died because of COVID-19. This claim is true. Our sources are CDC mortality data and health and human services population data. As of October 21st, the CDC says 42,778 black Americans have died from COVID-19. That's out of 41.4 million black Americans, according to HHS. So yes, based on this data and the math, we can verify that one in 1,000 black Americans have died from COVID-19. He was in possession of information back in January. That it could In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Now to efforts in Atlanta to protect the Asian American vote. A nonpartisan organization now is working to make sure non English speaking voters are prepared. Here's 11 Alive, she knew her. The Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta group has been working to get Asian American voters engaged. A big part of their work was translating voter materials. For most of his life, Chimeng Yang and his siblings have had to be translators for his parents who speak Hmong. Part of his right now is a big part of his politics and voting. He says although they couldn't speak English or read, they knew as American citizens they had a civic duty. So they don't just ask us to translate for something that they don't care about. So they know it's something important and they know that they want to do the right thing. That's what the nonprofit Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta wants all Asian American voters to do. Be informed even if you don't speak English. For us, it's just making sure that we're constantly putting that information out in language because the counties and the state um, for elections do not provide any um, Asian languages and written materials. Executive Director Stephanie Cho says their organization has translated voting guides and materials into several Asian languages. In Georgia, Asian American voters make up two and a half percent of all voters statewide, according to the Secretary of State's office. For Yang, he sees more than just a statistic, but a dream come true for his refugee parents. They never had that opportunity back then. Um, so now they get to have a voice. Cho says their organization has set up a phone bank with translators on hand to get people information before they hit the polls. We have their contact information on this story on 11alive.com. All right, let's take a look at some of the other top headlines we are following. Wall Street falling sharply today. Stimulus negotiations stall on Capitol Hill. The Dow closing down. 650 points. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, both accuse each other of moving the goalposts. The Treasury Secretary telling CNBC today the talks have certainly slowed, but insists they are close to coming to an agreement. No agreement yet. A new deal before Election Day looks unlikely. Actress Felicity Huffman done paying her price, her debt to society, for her part in the college admissions caper. She and other high-profile celebrities were exposed as lying cheats to get their kids into top-tier colleges. Huffman has now completed her supervised release in community service. She was convicted of paying $15,000 to make sure that her daughter's SAT score improved by 400 points. American Airlines is looking for ways to convince passengers it's safe to fly in a Boeing 737 MAX. The airline plans may include question and answer sessions with pilots and mechanics as well as tours of the plane. American says details have not been finalized. That airplane's been grounded worldwide since March of 2019 following two deadly crashes internationally. Breaking news, the Senate votes 5248 confirming Amy Coney Barrett as the new justice to the U.S. Supreme Court. She's 48 years of age. She is President Trump's third justice to be confirmed. She will give conservatives a six to three majority on the nation's highest court. Only one Republican senator, Susan Collins of Maine, voted against her for the seat. A ceremonial swearing in is expected to happen within the hour. Chief Justice John Roberts will administer an official judicial oath tomorrow.
We're still going to be watching Zeta. Really, this is going to be our focus this week as we track Zeta coming out of the Caribbean, crossing over the Yucatan Peninsula, and then into the Gulf of Mexico with an eventual landfall in the Gulf Coast region for the middle of the week. Here's the storm right now, getting really close to a landfall there at Cozumel, and it'll keep moving over land as we go through the overnight hours. Uh, we're going to be watching in our area. Once this system moves in, uh, we will see a flood watch in effect. So the storm is going to move up to the, uh, the coast of Louisiana once we get into a Wednesday afternoon, and then it's going to move up into Georgia as a tropical depression on Thursday. So that's going to send us a lot of rain. We have a flash flood watch in effect from Wednesday morning until Thursday evening, two to three inches of rain possible, some higher amounts, and we might be tweaking some of those rainfall amounts over the next couple of days. Uh, so here's what we're watching on the wasometer for your Tuesday. You know, not a bad day tomorrow. Uh, mostly cloudy skies. We're going to give that an eight on the wasometer with a low of 61 and a high of 78 degrees. So here's a look at the storm and the rain associated with it. All right, let's break down that rain risk first. And you can see it moving over the Yucatan. And then here it comes. There's Louisiana. This is Wednesday afternoon. The storm will make land, <coughs> excuse me, landfall in Louisiana uh, later in the day on uh, Wednesday. And then early Thursday morning, a tropical storm right here in southern parts of, of, Louis of Mississippi. And then it moves quickly. Uh, this is at 2.30 in the afternoon on Thursday. So you see there it moved really quickly from the morning hours on Thursday to the afternoon right up here. So it's going to be through the morning, early part on Thursday, when we see uh, the potential for our heavy rain, our storm risk, and also some of those strong winds moving in. That heavy rain in the afternoon up to the north, and then by the evening, that heaviest stuff pulls away, and we'll see the drier air moving in here by Friday and also Saturday. And what's going to kick this out of here so quickly is a cold front. And behind that front, we dry out and we cool off as we go toward the end of the week and also the weekend, too. Here is the wind risk that we're watching, all right? I want you to see this. This is, as we get into landfall, this is uh, late Wednesday into early on Thursday. And those strong winds coming into Louisiana, Mississippi, and much of the Florida panhandle uh, could be seeing some tropical storm force winds there on the right-hand side of the center. And then watch as this moves in, all right? Look at the legend here. The yellows, 20 mile an hour winds, the oranges into the reds between 30 and 40 mile an hour winds. They'll see that in Birmingham Thursday around 10. We'll see the 20 mile an hour winds beginning to move in here mid morning on your uh, Thursday. And then this is at 1:30. Look at the orange here in Metro Atlanta. We're talking some winds around 30 to 40 miles an hour and over parts of North Georgia as well. Then as the low moves up to the north, we still see some breezy conditions into Friday, but things start settling down behind that cold front. So our Main threats are going to be rain that could cause flooding, wind that could bring down some trees with the saturated ground that we have. We also are going to be watching a storm risk where whenever we have a landfalling tropical system, it is possible to have some brief spin up tornadoes. So that is going to be one of the things we're going to be watching as well early on Thursday. So enjoy tomorrow. It's still going to be mostly cloudy, but it's going to be a lot better than Wednesday and Thursday. Highs near 78. Rain coming in Wednesday. Better chance of shower, storms, wind, flooding uh, rain conditions here on Thursday, ending late, and then decreasing clouds Friday. Cooler air highs back to the 60s looking good Saturday Sunday and Monday just a really low rain chance with lows in the 40s and highs still in the 60s. It's only 60 days until Christmas and the coronavirus pandemic is making some presents harder to find this year. Retailers say that refurbished items could help you with your uh, wish list. Here's Dan Sheneman. Wasn't long ago that refurbished or open box items got a bad rap for being shoddy secondhand items. The bar is actually much higher for for refurbishing than it is for manufacturing. Sender Shamas is the CEO of GoTRG, a reverse logistics company that provides retailers and manufacturers a streamlined process for returned or damaged inventory. Refurbished can mean a product that was either broken or roughed up a little, but it could also mean an item someone decided they didn't want anymore. And we handle thousands of vendors and manufacturers and, and distributors. Go TRG processes over a million items each week. People think that what's bought um, in a store or online is usually ends up back on the shelf and that's the furthest thing away from the truth. Once returns hit the warehouse, turnaround time is pretty quick. Approximately seven days to process these goods. We've done in as little as three days. Like new items are then made available on the secondary market. 
So we have brands like VIP Outlet, the store.com. There's wholesale brands like directliquidation.com. But we sell a lot on eBay, Amazon, Walmart Marketplace. Buying a refurbished product can save money compared to buying it new. Consumers are price sensitive and they will take advantage of a deal if they find one. Giving a product a second life instead of sending it off to be recycled. All right, here's the prediction on what people will spend this year. $998, that includes gifts, decorations, food, all of that according to the National Retail Federation. Despite the pandemic and higher unemployment, that's only about $50 less than last year. One in five people say they typically will travel for the holidays but plan to celebrate at home this year instead. We're down to the finalists for our Oh Say Can You Sing contest in the AHAC Peachtree Road Rice and Peachtree Junior. The winner will have a chance to perform the national anthem virtually. Head to 11alive.com to vote for your favorite between now and this Friday. Coming up next, we are following up on the first potential ransomware attack to hit the election infrastructure right here in Georgia. On WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Say tonight on the Georgia County that may be the victim of the first ransomware attack to strike America's election infrastructure. CNN reporting that Hall County was hit with the cyber attack earlier this month. It impacted systems critical to the election, including a voter signature database and a voting precinct map. But federal investigators don't believe the attack specifically targeted election systems. A county spokeswoman told CNN they began investigating the cause immediately and, quote, the voting process for our citizens has not been impacted due to the network issues. We reached out to the Georgia Secretary of State's office, which tells us Hall County moved quickly to paper backups to confirm voter signatures, and that kept them from any serious delays processing ballots. A spokesperson also emphasized that 
There was no threat to the state voter registration system, saying cases like this are why Georgia has a decentralized election system. They were hoping their business would get picked up by a bigger company, but then a crucial piece of equipment was stolen from these young entrepreneurs off Crog Street. How you might be able to help them get it back coming up next. Some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Three entrepreneurs are asking for your help after the laptop they used to run their business was stolen. Caitlin Ross reports the founders of Moki Pops just want their computer back. The Robinson siblings started Moki Pops five years ago when their mom challenged them to get off their phones and do something creative. They've sold the vegan popsicles all over Atlanta, and as their popularity grows, they hope to be picked up by a retail chain. But they say this theft sets them back. We take off all the payment. Aya Robinson says she's learned a lot after starting Moki Pops with her brother and sister five years ago. Even though there is some beats, some twists and turns, never stop. Just keep going. But the family learned a hard lesson last weekend when thieves broke into their car and stole the MacBook Pro they used to keep the business running. I was mad because somebody was violating our own property. So, yeah, I was just mad and in an emotional space. The family car was parked in the Krog Street parking garage just off the Beltline. We're hoping that somebody's connected to somebody who might have seen what happened. Amber Con Robinson says police told her four other cars were broken into on the same deck. My computer was not in plain sight, so it was underneath the seat inside of a bag. Um, so I don't know if they were watching me. Um, I had only left the vehicle for 10 minutes when it had happened. Amber works full time to support her kids' business and says the laptop has hundreds of files vital to their success. Some of it is backed up, but we have original files, Photoshop, Illustrator files, um, a lot of financial documents that were on the computer. While police don't have any leads yet, the family was back out selling Moki Pops today. Aya says they're not about to let the thieves win.
And we just all have to stay together and, you know, like, don't let anybody ruin our day. The family started a GoFundMe to try and recoup the cost of the laptop, but they say more than anything, they want their computer back so they can get their files back. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight at 9, it hasn't exactly been a main stop for candidates on the campaign trail, but a rural Georgia community could prove to play a big role in the election results. An increase in COVID cases among school-aged children in Georgia were breaking down the numbers. Plus, a single mother drowning in debt and facing eviction, a snapshot of the predicament facing hundreds of thousands of Georgians amid the pandemic. Welcome, everyone. On this Monday, we start with breaking news out of Clayton County. Police say one person was shot and killed near Riverdale High School. It happened around 5 this evening. The school district telling us no staff or students are hurt, and those involved were locals and not enrolled in the district. We are working to try to get you more information. We'll keep you updated as soon as we learn. The latest major poll out of Georgia showing President Trump and Joe Biden neck and neck fighting to gain an edge. 47% saying they favor Biden in the AJC poll. 46% saying they're voting for President Trump. 4% indicating they're still undecided. Another sign this could be a close one. Tomorrow, Democrat Joe Biden will become the first Democratic presidential contender to visit the state of Georgia since Bill Clinton. 11 Alive's Doug Richards is looking into the significance of his visit and where he is headed. Joe Biden will tug at the history of Warm Springs when he visits here Tuesday. It's home to the Rehabilitation Center, founded by Democrat Franklin Roosevelt 95 years ago when Roosevelt was diagnosed with polio. The 32nd president was a regular visitor and died at his cabin here in 1945. But history is only part of the story of Biden's visit. The fact that Biden is here, that he is taking his most finite resource, time, to come to Georgia suggests for the first time really that the Biden campaign thinks that Georgia is in the gettable category. Warm Springs is in Meriwether County. It's a Republican county, but with enough Democratic voters to keep a Democrat like Bob Trammell in the state House of Representatives. You would call my district a swing district. You would call Georgia at this point undeniably a, a swing state in the presidential uh, contest. President Trump won Meriwether County with 57 percent of the vote in 2016. But Trump got bigger vote totals in neighboring Troop, Coweta, and Pike counties. Yet Trump lost Talbot County just to the south. Trammell replaced Stacey Abrams as the House Democratic leader. Trammell says Republicans have spent a million dollars on behalf of his opponent, David Jenkins, unheard of in a state House race. I'm confident that voters see through uh, that excessively absurd expenditure, uh, but it also communicates exactly uh, how much Georgia is really in play. And Biden stumping in mostly Republican rural Georgia may make some sense in a newly christened swing state. For Trump, Georgia is truly must win. If Biden is able to just collapse Trump's margins a little bit in rural counties, that would be a major factor. President Trump won Georgia in 2016 by about 200,000 votes. There are 2 million more registered voters in Georgia now than there were in 2016. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers here with you live on the ATL as well as on my phone right here. It's propped up on here because I'm on live with about 250, 300 people on Facebook Live right now. And we're talking a lot about what we're watching with Hurricane Zeta. Here's the storm down in the Caribbean right now. It is moving up over the Yucatan Peninsula, about to make landfall at Cozumel. Then we'll move over the Yucatan Peninsula and emerge back out over water, we think, uh, at some point tomorrow. Still is a hurricane and then it starts to strengthen a little bit more over the Gulf of Mexico. Here we are Wednesday afternoon just to the south of Louisiana. We think we'll have a landfall later in the evening hours on Wednesday and then overnight Wednesday into Thursday it becomes a tropical storm in the southern parts of Mississippi and then a tropical depression as it moves through west and northwest Georgia. So this is the part we have to watch here from overnight Wednesday into early Thursday into the afternoon hours on Thursday. And as that tracks through, we're going to have the potential for some wind 
also some storms and the potential for some heavy rain. So here's a look at our main impacts and threats that we're going to be watching as we go through the next few days here. This is mainly for late Wednesday into Thursday. With rain, we can see two to three inches. We have that flash flood watch that's in effect. Also winds, they could be mainly, mainly gusting to 30 to 40 miles an hour at times early on Thursday. And yes, we do have a storm risk as well. And whenever you have a land falling a tropical system and a tropical depression tracking through your state, you do have the potential for some spin up tornadoes. That's not a guarantee, but it is possible. We don't think the severe weather threat is going to be widespread. We think the heavier rain and that wind threat is going to be more widespread. And with winds like that and a saturated ground, you not only have flooding, but you can see some trees coming down too. stay with us. We'll break down these threats a little bit more for you coming up in just a little bit. With just over a week to go, the presidential candidates are busy and they are being strategic on the campaign trail. Polls show that Georgia is in play, so we are receiving a lot of attention from both Republicans and Democrats. Today, Dr. Jill Biden was in Macon in Savannah, stumping for her husband, former Vice President Joe Biden. She is rallying people, particularly women, to try and vote. And now, in the final week of early voting in Georgia, we have checked in on many polling locations today. Voting has been slow. Uh, it has been steady, not slow. Impressive and record-breaking numbers. 2.9 million Georgians have already cast their ballots in person or by mail, a 107% increase from 2016. Nationally, 62 million people have voted early. That is more than the total number of early votes in the last presidential election. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger anticipates hundreds of thousands of more ballots will be cast this week before early voting ends. He told voters to expect longer lines, particularly as the week winds down, but he also urged voters to trust that his office is doing everything it can to protect your vote and to get a jump on counting results. They're also doing the adjudication as you're moving through the absentee ballot count. So if there's some ballots that kick out because people didn't mark them properly, they're adjudicating those right now so we'll have a relatively timely result and get you results a lot sooner than many other states. Secretary Raffensperger says right now all 159 counties are scanning absentee ballots ahead of time to streamline the counting process once the polls close on Election Day. As of this evening, the state has seen a 649% increase in the number of absentee ballots cast compared to 2016, largely due to the pandemic. The 11 Alive Voter Access Team is committed to making sure your voices are heard. If you have a concern you want us to address, send us an email at whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com or text us 404-885-7600 and check out our voter guide on 11alive.com slash vote. It was back to class today for many high school students in Henry County. The county entered its fourth and final phase of its return to campus plan. High school students have the choice of in-person learning five days a week. Earlier this month, pre-K through eighth grade students were allowed to return. According to the district, 36 percent of families chose in-person learning. Now we have been seeing COVID cases go up again in Georgia. A group to keep an eye on are school-aged children and younger. Cases have gone up in the last two weeks. That is according to the very latest news and information from the public health report. Week, after, uh, week over week, cases in this age group are up by about 4%. They are the third highest group for cases in Georgia. Yesterday, the state reported there have been more than 27,000 cases in the 5 to 17-year-old age bracket. Children between 1 and 4 are seeing a slightly larger increase. Cases are up 7% uh, a week to week. And as of yesterday, DPH reported more than 4,000 COVID cases among the youngest age group. Most of the cases in this group are in Gwinnett, Fulton, and DeKalb counties. Every day we hear about cases and hospitalizations from COVID-19. People's health is what matters most, but there are many parts of the pandemic that have impacted people in different ways. Matt Pearl has spent the past several months producing a new series called The Ripple, which puts the spotlight on those wide reaching impacts. One of them, the estimated hundreds of thousands of Georgians now at risk for eviction. <laughs> The best thing that brought me to Alpharetta was just the peace of mind. It was a good place for kids to run and block. I'm Vanessa. I'm a single mom of three. <laughs> Aiden, Khalees, and Carmen. 
uh, I would usually drop them off and I would keep going to work. And my job was from eight to three. It took me forever to find this position, just being a mommy and single. Hooker. I'm executive director for the Atlanta Regional Commission. Last year alone, we had 150,000 uh, eviction filings. In a good economy, in a quote-unquote normal year, our estimate is as many as 40% of regional households could be under threat of eviction if nothing is done. This is very widespread. A lot of people don't realize they see a lot of apartments uh, downtown and midtown. The predominant number of affordable units are actually out in suburban communities. It's not stopping me from having to pay my rent. I'm still under contract with my landlord. Even when December 31st comes, then when? So now I have a mounting debt, no foreseeable job, three kids. It's scary. And the worst thing that can happen is that we ignore this problem, wait for somebody else to come and solve it, find out the Calvary is not coming right away, or if at all, and then we have thousands and tens of thousands of people who might have been helped wandering the streets. I think what worries me the most is that even if the community harnesses a lot of philanthropic support, the most that we can do is still a finger in the dike. I have to show strength to them in the time of worrying. I have to let them know that everything is going to be okay. Even though on my mind, I'm not sure. Right now, I can't breathe. Right now, Matt Pearl has spent the past several months producing a new series called The Ripple, which puts the spotlight on those affected by the pandemic. The documentary is now available online. You can check it out on 11alive.com slash The Ripple. Threatened, beaten, and dragged from her car, a fourth victim speaking about a terrifying attack by a serial robber targeting drivers in Metro Atlanta. Don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join in. We have more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you attacks on four separate drivers in Midtown. Police believe one man is behind them all. Investigators in Atlanta and then Sandy Springs were already looking into three incidents. Now you have a fourth victim that has come forward. She tells her Hope Ford about a terrifying struggle that ended with her being punched and then dragged from the car, all while trying to protect her mother. It was October 9th, just after 4 p.m. outside the dump of furniture store in Buckhead. A woman who wanted to remain anonymous sat in her car near the entrance when a man opened the back door. He climbed in the car, shut the door, and I just knew right then and there, oh, oh my God. The attacker screamed for her to drive off, threatening to kill her, but the victim fought back, mainly concerned over her passenger, her 76-year-old mother. My voice was shaky, and I was like, this is my mother. Then he grabs me, starts pulling me over the center car, my mom starts hitting him on the back to let me go. A struggle continues until the attacker throws a right hook into my left eye, just goes boom. The victim was pulled from the car as the attacker drove off. Her car was eventually found days later at the Summit Condos in Sandy Springs. Police also say the man attacked a driver there, forcing another victim to drive him to an ATM. In total, at least four robberies, kidnappings, and carjackings are linked to this man, with three victims being forced to drive him to an ATM. The victim we talked to actually considers herself lucky because she was thrown from the car. I cannot imagine how these women feel about about to be driving this guy around and feeling scared to death for minutes upon minutes. The victim tells Hope it took almost two weeks to locate her car at a tow yard, replace her credit cards, and retrieve her license. She also says her uh, items found in her car could belong to the attackers. She has handed those over to APD. A Crime Stoppers reward of $2,000 now being offered for information leading to the suspect's arrest. Atlanta police tell us this is urgent. They want the guy off the streets before he strikes again. This man is allegedly connected to four different attacks as marked on the map. Three are being investigated by APD, one by Sandy Springs Police. Another victim, Robin, told us last week, you may remember, she was leaving a salon when the man jumped into her car, threatened her with a gun, forced her to drive to an ATM to withdraw cash. She told us all she could do is to try to talk to him. And I told him, you know, I've just been through breast cancer, and he, I'm so sorry. Are you okay now? I mean, he, he was a nice guy. The surveillance video and sketch is all police have to go on right now. If you want to take a closer look, you can download the 11 Alive News app and look for the story in the As Seen on TV section. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Once again, I know you're seeing, seeing my phone sitting here on the stand in the TV shot. That's because I'm also not only doing TV, but I'm doing Facebook Live with, again, between 100 and 150 people here uh, on Facebook Live. And, and our, our main focus that we're talking about on Facebook Live tonight is Zeta and the potential impacts for us. And that's what I want to break down for you right now, too. Here's the storm down in the Caribbean making landfall right there near Cozumel. Moving, it's going to be moving over the Yucatan Peninsula uh, overnight tonight and then emerging back out over water in the Gulf of Mexico tomorrow with winds around 75 miles an hour, strengthening again, coming back up to about 80 mile an hour winds uh, during the day on Wednesday, just south of Louisiana Wednesday afternoon. We think we'll have a landfall there Wednesday evening in Louisiana and then a tropical storm overnight Wednesday into Thursday in the southern parts of Mississippi that you see right here. And then this is the part from southern Mississippi through Alabama and then into northwest Georgia and, and through North Georgia, that's where you see it becoming a tropical depression. So on that time frame between Thursday at 2 in the morning and Thursday at 2 in the afternoon, as this approaches early on Thursday, that's where we're going to see the biggest risk for some uh, rain, also some wind and a storm risk in our area as well on Thursday. And then the storm quickly on Friday moves up just to the east of Boston. Here's a look at the watches that we have right now. There is a hurricane watch for much of Louisiana, also into Mississippi, and then a tropical storm watch for the Alabama coast on over to a Destin there in the Florida Panhandle. 
Here in our area, we have a flash flood watch in effect that has been issued already for Wednesday morning through Thursday evening. All of North Georgia, Metro Atlanta and areas down to the south uh, could see flash flooding with two to three inches of rain coming through uh, with some heavy rain. We're also watching the storm risk. This is the risk for Wednesday. We don't have the outlook for Thursday yet. We'll be able to break that down a little bit more for tomorrow. But for Wednesday, we have a marginal risk in a, a central and southern Alabama, the Panhandle, also the southern parts of um, Mississippi and even over toward Louisiana. I do think that that risk could be extended over into our area by Thursday. So here's how we're looking Tuesday, tomorrow, an eight on the wisometer. High temperatures right around 78 degrees with mostly cloudy skies out there. Here's the storm. You can see it there over the Yucatan and then watch as it moves through the Gulf. This is Wednesday at noon uh, and then it makes that landfall later in the evening. And then watch here. This is Thursday morning. And then Thursday afternoon, it's right up here. So it's that time frame when we see the heaviest rain, wind, and the storm risk that'll be moving through our area. And then we clear out once we get into um, Friday and into the weekend as well. So here's the seven-day outlook. 78 for a high Tuesday, mostly cloudy. Rain coming in on Wednesday. And then the uh, rain storm risk early on Thursday with the wind risk as well, a high of 77. And then as the tropical moisture moves out and uh, we have cooler air coming in with drier weather for the end of the week. And then for Sunday and Monday, only a really low rain risk at a 20 to 30 percent chance for showers with highs still in the 60s. Local businesses already adapting to operate during the pandemic now forced to figure out how to stay open safely as colder weather pushes people indoors. You can see the steps that one local salon owner is taking. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. The U.S. hit a harrowing record on Friday with more than 80,000 new COVID-19 cases, and that is the highest single-day leap since the country's peak in July. According to the CDC, Georgia ranks fifth for total coronavirus cases in the country, and today the Department of Public Health. The numbers show there were 958 new cases reported while testing remains low. The state's peak was also in mid-July. More than 4,800 cases were reported in a single day. Today, there were 18 new deaths reported. This is below our 14-day average. August 22nd was the highest single day for deaths with more than 120 reported. 
With cooler weather comes a new challenge for businesses trying to stay open during the pandemic. Tracy Emick Pierre talked to a Midtown hair salon owner about how he is adapting. You've got staff that don't know what to do. After 33 years in business, all of your stock, your color, your inventory. Steve you Hightower says this pandemic has been the biggest challenge of his career, closing down the Steve Hightower hair salon and day spa on Lindbergh Way for more than six weeks. Rent goes on, everything else goes on. I did apply for the PPP loan, mm -hmm. but it came three weeks after I reopened. So I actually sent it back. Hightower says his clients range from six years old to 95. I specialize in fine thinning hair. I work with a lot of clients that have chemo. Presenting another challenge, how to make clients feel safe coming in. So three months ago, he changed his outdoor deck into an outdoor extension of his salon. Right now, pretty much they're coming outside and they're loving it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, in the fall, we're going to have it heated, and so they're going to continue to come. But Hightower says he ran into yet another challenge when he tried to buy outdoor heaters. Heater is the new toilet paper. I called every Home Depot in the city, every Lowe's. No one had one. I called Sam's. They had 16. I literally got in my car and drove there. By the time I got there, they only had one left. <laughs> so now they'll wrap plastic around the back deck, letting air get through while making the most of the heater they have. Hightower says every new challenge takes some new ideas and a lot of faith. I pray every day to watch over us, to watch over my clients, my staff, and we'll get through this. It's going to take a while. Hightower says business now is less than half of what it was last year at this time, and he doesn't expect that to increase until next spring. He just hopes they can stay afloat until that time. We have talked a lot about how much things have changed from the way that we work or how we spend our money right now. Some stores are preparing for a possible second wave of pandemic shopping. Now, remember seeing grocery shelves like this? Well, things have calmed down a bit, but there is concern about this could happen again if there is a surge in COVID or perhaps a fear over unrest around the election. And while many Americans are still concerned about the economy, data from Lending Tree shows that we are actually spending more at the grocery store. Average weekly grocery spending increased by 17% since pre-pandemic times. Something else flying off store shelves, board games like Monopoly. Sales of classics are soaring. Uh, Hasbro has reported a 21% jump in gaming sales since the pandemic began. Up next, waging a war against misinformation. The impact one phony, fake, fraudulent claim is having on Georgia voters. Anna Speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF.
There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Judge Amy Coney Barrett now headed to the U.S. Supreme Court, the Senate confirming her by a margin of 52 to 48. The nomination of Amy Coney Barrett of Indiana to be an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States is confirmed. The 48 year old is President Trump's third justice to be confirmed. She will give conservatives a six to three majority on the nation's highest court. Only one Republican Senator, Susan Collins of Maine, voted against her for the seat. A ceremonial swearing in occurred uh, about five minutes ago. Chief Justice John Roberts administered the official judicial oath. Uh, we'll, we'll do so tomorrow. All right, call it what you want, but the information is wrong. Out and out lies. Voters across the country now are being hit with a wave of disinformation. The goal, manipulating the election, either persuading people's vote or making them frightened enough that they might not want to vote. Social media feeds are flooded with false claims. This month, Twitter banned dozens of accounts of users pretending to be black supporters of President Trump. NBC reports there were profiles created using stock images of black people to spread misleading information. Cybersecurity experts say that black and Latino voters are being targeted with digital disinformation to sway their decisions or to keep them from voting. One of the most common false claims is about the security of absentee ballots. According to NBC, since January, almost a quarter of the 13 million mentions of vote by mail on social media included misinformation. In Georgia, a new Survey USA poll showing 86% of registered voters have seen claims that mail-in ballots will lead to an increase in voter fraud. 42% believe it's true, even though some states have used mail-in ballots for many years with little or no issues. When Georgians were asked where they have seen these fake claims about voter fraud most often, 61% said Facebook. A distant second is YouTube, followed by Twitter. You can't believe everything you see shared around the Internet. Well, we've been talking a lot about Zeta and its impacts, but that'll really be late Wednesday into Thursday. I want to show you what we're watching right now. We have clouds, not in association with Zeta at all. This is just a lot of moisture that we have left behind from the rain that we've been dealing with. But we don't see any rain out of this. We might have a little bit of fog redeveloping here tomorrow. And then as we widen out, you see the rest of the southeast, just a few clouds around, but no additional rain moving our way. This is Zeta. This is what we're going to be focusing on this week as that system moves in late Wednesday into Thursday, giving us some impacts with rain, a wind threat, and maybe even some storms that will be coming through. You can see the landfall right now, right there coming in over the Yucatan Peninsula, crossing over the peninsula and then moving up into the Gulf of Mexico. And we expect a landfall on uh, late Wednesday along the Gulf Coast region. We have a hurricane watch in effect for much of the Louisiana coast and Mississippi coast. A tropical storm watch extends through the Alabama coast over to around the Destin area. Stay with us. Once this makes landfall in the northern Gulf Coast, region, the remnants will pass through Georgia. And yes, we will have some impacts from that. We're going to break that down for you coming up in just a few minutes. Political analysts point to Georgia as a battleground state in this year's presidential election. The polls indicate a very close race here between the president and the former vice president. Both candidates focusing a lot of energy on Georgia. But why is our state so important this year? Here's our why guy. The song is a classic. This year, it's the candidates for president who were singing Georgia on my mind. The campaigns have spent in excess of $10 million in advertising in this state, far more than the amount spent here in 2016. Georgia is more important this time around because the race looks uh, competitive. Let's explore the reasons why Georgia is considered a battleground state in this year's presidential election. 
Georgia has sided with the Republican candidate for president in every election since 1992. George Bush carried the state by 16 percentage points in 2004. Donald Trump's 2016 victory margin was about 5%. The trends are moving towards Democrats. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that this year they triumph, but you know, it, it gives Democrats encouragement. Public opinion polls have shown a tight race in Georgia. What we're expecting is, is that this race is going to be decided, you know, by, you know, a few hundred thousand votes uh, at best, if not less. The Electoral College will ultimately decide the race. Georgia has 16 electors, more than all but seven other states. Republicans for the last couple of decades have relied on uh, Georgia providing 16 Electoral College votes to lose that uh, would be a blow. Since Bill Clinton took the state in 1992, the closest a Democrat has come to winning Georgia was Clinton four years later, when Republican Bob Dole's margin of victory here was less than 2%. You tonight, civil rights attorneys are accusing the city of Atlanta. And well, of course, I want to remind you that uh, if you have a question for the Y guy, Jerry Carnes would love to hear from you. A lot of ways to talk with him. Facebook, of course, Jerry Carnes uh, also uh, uh, can be found on Twitter. He is an active man, a man of the people, for the people. So help him every day. And you can do that by sending him a note. New tonight, civil rights attorneys are accusing the city of Atlanta of delaying justice in nearly two dozen police brutality cases. Joe Hankey has reaction from both sides. The attorneys represent dozens of people who have either been injured or killed by Atlanta police officers and now have active lawsuits against the city. The attorneys claim the city has delayed such lawsuits to put off paying any costly settlements. You can't say publicly we're sorry, we're outraged, and show compassion, but in the courtroom show the opposite. Around 20 civil rights attorneys today said when they sued the city of Atlanta for damages following a violent arrest or a case of an officer wrongfully killing someone, the city delays any civil lawsuit. Kane Rogers was killed in 2016 by APD officer James Burns. The city of Atlanta then fired Burns. But four years later, a lawsuit Rogers' family filed against the city is still pending. In the case of 92-year-old Katherine Johnston, killed in 2006 when Atlanta officers mistakenly served a no-knock warrant at her home, it took four years for her family to reach a nearly $5 million settlement. Recently, the city of Louisville agreed to pay Breonna Taylor's family $12 million for her death following a botched police raid in March involving Louisville officers. Breonna Taylor family has already gotten some justice. We got families here been years waiting for the city of Atlanta to step up. Sean Williams and other attorneys and speaking outside of City Hall today said the reason for the delays, the city does not insure its officers, making it challenging to pay large settlements. A city of Atlanta spokesman in response sent 11 Alive a statement reading, for the past several decades, the city has been self-insured, including the city's vehicles. If the city used private insurance coverage, it is doubtful that coverage would include police officers who have acted outside of city policies. City employees, including police officers, are represented by the city if they are sued, as as a result of actions taken in the course of their employment. And the attorneys we heard from today said any changes would not impact active cases they have filed against the city of Atlanta, but changes could impact cases that come up in the future. All right, COVID-19 cases surging again across the United States. Now for the first time, the virus spreading through rural communities where public health officials worry about falling temperatures, driving more people indoors. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. This morning, the COVID crisis, after shattering its single-day record of new infections, is now in its third wave nationally, and it's ravaging many smaller communities for the first time. I think there's an increasingly high level of fatigue, Abe, especially in the rural parts of the country, because we were told back in May and June how bad it was going to be, and it never came. Well, now it's here. In South Dakota, the mayor of Sioux Falls is pleading with residents to wear masks, but the governor says it should be a choice, tweeting if folks want to wear a mask, they are free to do so. Those who don't want to wear a mask shouldn't be shamed into it. Still, COVID cases in 43 states and D.C. are up at least 10 percent in the last two weeks, including record numbers in Illinois, which has topped 9,500 deaths. Excuse me, please. It weighs heavily on the state's health director. These are mothers and fathers and grandparents, co-workers. It's, it's, it's overwhelming. More heartbreak at the University of Dayton in Ohio, where freshman Michael Lang died of complications from COVID-19. Our kid is in a better place. And, you know, he'll be looking down on us, so. 
but he's 18. He was way too young. Way too young. Politicians and social media are both known for saying a lot about coronavirus, throwing out some shocking numbers. As part of our commitment to bring you facts, not fear, our Verify team looks into a recent claim about the virus and its impact on black Americans. Verify is your trusted source for facts during this election season. Let's look into this claim from Vice Presidential nominee Kamala Harris. One in 1,000. That's the number of black Americans that have died, died because of COVID-19. This claim is true. Our sources are CDC mortality data and health and human services population data. As of October 21st, the CDC says 42,778 black Americans have died from COVID-19. That's out of 41.4 million black Americans, according to HHS. So yes, based on this data and the math, we can verify that one in 1,000 black Americans have died from COVID-19. 11 Alive committed to bringing you facts and fighting misinformation. If you see something you'd like us to verify, email us at verify at 11alive.com. The faces of Metro Atlanta are changing and it's crucial every year one of the voices is heard at the polls. Still to come, the push to help protect one local community's votes. Off or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical. Now to efforts in Atlanta protect the Asian American vote. A nonpartisan organization is working to make sure that non-English speaking voters are prepared. Here's 11 Alive, Shanu Her.
The Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta group has been working to get Asian American voters engaged. A big part of their work was translating voter materials. For most of his life, Chimeng Yang and his siblings have had to be translators for his parents who speak Hmong. A part of it right now is a big part of his politics and voting. He says although they couldn't speak English or read, they knew as American citizens they had a civic duty. So they don't just ask us to translate for something that they don't care about. So they know it's something important they may know that they want to do the right thing. That's what the nonprofit Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta wants all Asian American voters to do. Be informed even if you don't speak English. For us, it's just making sure that we're constantly putting that information out in language because the counties and the state um, for elections do not provide any um, Asian languages and written materials. Executive Director Stephanie Cho says their organization has translated voting guides and materials into several Asian languages. In Georgia, Asian American voters make up two and a half percent of all voters statewide, according to the Secretary of State's office. For Yang, he sees more than just a statistic, but a dream come true for his refugee parents. They never had that opportunity back then. Um, so now they get to have a voice. Cho says their organization has set up a phone bank with translators on hand to get people information before they hit the polls. We have their contact information on this story on 11alive.com. And of course, we are watching uh, Hurricane Zeta not impacting us yet, even though we have clouds in our area right now and we'll have a good coverage of clouds tomorrow. I do think we'll see a few more breaks in the clouds tomorrow to give us a few peaks of sunshine here and there. And our temperatures are going to warm up just a little bit more getting into the upper 70s. And some folks may even break 80 degrees tomorrow. Here's what we're watching with Zeta. It's this storm down in the Caribbean. It is a hurricane. Maximum sustained winds at 80 miles an hour. It is nearing the Yucatan Peninsula, most likely seeing a landfall right now. Uh, as it crosses over the Yucatan overnight and then it moves up toward the north. Now the spaghetti model excuse me, plots are pretty similar to what we're seeing with the track from the Hurricane Center with a landfall in Louisiana later in the day on Wednesday and then the remnants track through southern Mississippi, Alabama and then through northwest Georgia early on Thursday. So we're going to see most of our impacts here overnight Wednesday into early on Thursday with the rain risk, the wind risk, and also the risk for some storms that will be moving through. And we have a flash flood watch that's already in effect. Now it doesn't, the Weather Service issued this today, but it doesn't really go into effect until Wednesday in the morning, and then it'll be in effect until Thursday evening. They're just giving us a good uh, early notice of this to be prepared for some of these pockets of heavy rain. We're talking about two to three inches, but the ground is pretty saturated, so it's going to cause a lot of runoff and that water will run off into creeks and streams and also into some low lying areas where we could see some flash flooding occurring uh, on the wasometer for tomorrow. Not a bad day. It's going to be mostly cloudy. I mean, not bright and sunny or anything. Mostly cloudy. A few peaks of sunshine here and there. We'll go with an eight on the wasometer. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day and highs right at about 78 degrees. Here's the European model. This is showing the rain in association with Zeta as it moves over the Yucatan, then in the Gulf here. This is a Wednesday around lunchtime, making landfall later on Wednesday. Here we are. This goes into Thursday morning, so landfall late Wednesday and then Thursday morning. This is a fast mover. It'll be in the southern parts of Mississippi and then going from here to here by Thursday afternoon. So that's the time frame overnight Wednesday into early on Thursday when that moves quickly up to the north ahead of that main area of low pressure in that right front quadrant is where we're going to see the heaviest rain, the storm risk, and also the potential for some of those winds. And since it's moving quickly, it clears out of here Friday. We have a northwest wind that'll be dry and much cooler here in our area. Here's a look at the wind fields. All right, this is what we're going to be watching with some of those wind gusts coming in. As the storm moves inland, all that heavy rain around Louisiana. But then look at the legend here. The yellow is over 20 miles an hour. When you get to the oranges and reds, that's between 30 and 40 miles an hour. So we're seeing uh, 20 mile an hour winds early on Thursday. And then look at this, some pockets of the orange of winds that could be 30 to 40 miles an hour in Metro Atlanta and in North Georgia on Thursday. And then it moves out quickly and we see those winds dying down once we get into Friday and also on Saturday. So mostly cloudy Tuesday, high of 78. Rain coming in on Wednesday. The best chance for the rain, storms and wind will be early on Thursday. Highs near 77, and then we're clearing out Friday, cooling off too for the end of the week with highs in the 60s, lows in the 40s for the weekend too. A low rain risk comes back Sunday and into Monday.
Chris, thank you. Let's take a look at some of the other top headlines that we are following tonight on this Monday. Wall Street falling sharply today as stimulus negotiations stall on Capitol Hill. The Dow closing down 650 points. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows both accuse each other of moving the goalposts. The Treasury Secretary telling CNBC Today talks have certainly slowed down, but insisting they are close to coming to an agreement. But no agreement yet. A new deal before the election day looks unlikely. Watch out using the term new deal. Actress Felicity Huffman done paying the price, her debt to society for her part in the college admissions caper. She and other high-profile celebrities were exposed as lion cheats to get their kids into top-tier colleges. Huffman has now completed her supervised release in community service. She was convicted of paying about $15,000 to try and get her daughter's SAT up by about 400 points. American Airlines looking for ways to convince passengers it's safe to fly in a Boeing 737 MAX. The airline plans may include question and answer sessions with pilots and mechanics as well as tours of the plane. American says details still aren't finalized. The MAX has been grounded worldwide since March of 2019 following those two deadly crashes internationally. It is 60 days until Christmas and Christmas decorations can be seen through store windows this weekend. The coronavirus pandemic making some Presents harder to find this year. Retailers say refurbished items, slightly used, could be just fine. Here's Dan Shenneman. Wasn't long ago that refurbished or open box items got a bad rap for being shoddy secondhand items. The bar is actually much higher for, for refurbishing than it is for manufacturing. Sender Shamas is the CEO of GoTRG, a reverse logistics company that provides retailers and manufacturers a streamlined process for returned or damaged inventory. Refurbished can mean a product that was either broken or roughed up a little, but it could also mean an item someone decided they didn't want anymore. And we handle thousands of vendors and manufacturers and, and distributors. GoTRG processes over a million items each week. People think that what's bought um, in a store or online is usually ends up back on the shelf and that's the furthest thing away from the truth. Once returns hit the warehouse, turnaround time is pretty quick. Approximately seven days to process these goods. We've done in as little as three days. Like new items are then made available on the secondary market. So we have brands like VIP Outlet, the store.com. There's wholesale brands like directliquidation.com. But we sell a lot on eBay, Amazon, Walmart Marketplace. Buying a refurbished product can save money compared to buying it new. Consumers are price sensitive and they will take advantage of a deal if they find one. Giving a product a second life instead of sending it off to be recycled. We're down to the finalists in our Oh Say Can You Sing contest for the AHAC Peachtree Road Race and the Peachtree Junior. The winner will have the chance to perform the national anthem virtually. Head to 11alive.com to vote for your favorite between now and this Friday. Stay with us. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. 
We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. An update tonight on the Georgia County that may be the victim of the first ransomware attack to strike America's election infrastructure. Here's what we know. CNN reporting that Hall County was hit with this cyber attack earlier this month. It affected systems critical to the election, including a voter signature database and a voting precinct map. But federal investigators don't believe the attack specifically targeted election systems. A county spokeswoman told CNN they began investigating the cause immediately and, quote, the voting process for our citizens has not been impacted due to the network issues. We reached out to the Georgia Secretary of State's office, which tells us Hall County moved quickly to paper backups to confirm voters' signatures, and that kept them from any serious delays processing the ballots. A spokesperson also emphasized there was no threat to the state voter registration system, saying that cases like this are why Georgia has a decentralized election system. Mostly cloudy skies for your Tuesday. High temperatures around 78 degrees. A few peaks of sun here and there. And then the rain moves in later on Wednesday. We have a storm risk overnight Wednesday and through early on Thursday with a higher storm wind and flood risk on Thursday. Then drying out and cooling off for the end of the weekend. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. News primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight at 10, we are days away from the election. Both candidates are making their final stops on the campaign trail. Former Vice President Biden arriving in Georgia tomorrow. We take a closer look at what to expect ahead of his visit. A Cobb County Board of Education member took a knee protesting the death of inmates at Cobb County's detention center, why he did it, and the reaction he is getting from his colleagues. Cooler temperatures are on the way, bringing new challenges for local businesses during the pandemic. What one Atlanta salon owner is doing to keep his business up and running. But on this Monday night, we started with breaking news in Clayton County. Police say that one person is now dead after a shooting near Riverdale High School. Here's what we know. It happened around 5 o'clock this evening. The school district telling us no staff or students have been hurt. This is video from the scene. Police are looking for two suspects. The district says those involved were locals and not anyone associated with the school. We'll keep you updated as we learn more. A woman tells police that an officer sexually assaulted her, and now police say her attacker was posing as a police officer. They arrested him, and they are looking for more possible victims. John Cherick is on the story for us tonight from DeKalb County Police Headquarters. He has the very latest. John? This is the second time in two months the same man has been arrested and charged with committing crimes while impersonating a police officer. This time, though, he's accused of sexually assaulting a woman. It was Sunday night, and police say a woman pulled her car off of the street into the Redan Park parking lot. She had just had an argument with her boyfriend, police say, and she'd left home to be alone for a few minutes. Suddenly, a car pulled up behind hers. And what she described as a police-like tactic. DeKalb County Police SVU Captain William Wallace says this man, Christopher Griggs, was dressed in a tactical police uniform, had a badge, a gun, and walked up to the woman's car shining a flashlight at her, accused her of committing crimes, and threatened to arrest. Her. He presented himself as a police officer and he asked her or ordered her to exit her vehicle and get back in his vehicle. Captain Wallace says the man they now believe is Christopher Griggs sexually assaulted the woman in his car and she was somehow able to break free and call 911. Police arrested Griggs within hours. They already knew about him. It was just this past August when Gwinnett County Police charged Griggs with impersonating a DeKalb County police officer in a theft related case. Police say they're investigating if Griggs has other victims too. Too afraid to come forward thinking that a police officer had attacked them. Captain Wallace is asking them to come forward now and call 911. There's possibility that there are additional crimes out there that we've not been made aware of where this person is acting as a police officer. Captain Wallace says the woman last night showed strength and courage, did everything right, managed to get away, and even though she thought a police officer is the one who had just attacked her, she called 911, trusting police would come to help her. Jeff. A troubling story. John for us in uh, DeKalb County tonight. We are keeping a close eye on Hurricane Zeta and Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb joins us now. Chris, what impacts are we starting to see here now? Well, we'll see some impacts, but those won't come until late Wednesday and into Thursday. 
And we've had these landfalling tropical systems before. We could have anything from heavy rain, flooding possible, uh, strong winds with it, and maybe even some isolated tornadoes. Th those are the threats that we're watching right now. We're going to be fine-tuning this. Here's Zeta right now. You can see the storm that is uh, really nearing landfall as we uh, get that right there along the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula uh, near Cozumel, Cancun's right up here. It's going to move across the Yucatan and then move back out over water later tomorrow afternoon still as a hurricane. And then it moves up through the Gulf of Mexico, most likely gaining some strength, maybe up to 80 mile an hour winds. Wednesday afternoon, it's just south of Louisiana. We think we'll have a landfall in Louisiana later on Wednesday and then early Thursday. This is really overnight, Thursday at about 2 in the morning. A tropical storm in Mississippi, then moving up through Alabama, through Georgia as a tropical depression through west and northwest Georgia and into northeast Georgia. This is the plot for Thursday afternoon. So between here, Thursday overnight, Wednesday overnight into early Thursday and then Thursday afternoon on this track. We're going to see our conditions getting worse here with those pockets of heavy rain. Also the wind threat and a storm risk as well early on Thursday and then it quickly by Friday moves up uh, just to the east of Boston. So here are the main impacts that we're going to be talking about potentially from this storm with rain two to three inches of rain possible. Now I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but we uh, we have saturated ground. And so any additional rain could cause some flash flooding with the flash flood watching effect. Winds, we could have winds gusting 30 to 40 miles an hour early on Thursday. That could bring down some trees. And then for the storm risk, there's always that possibility of some brief spin up tornadoes with a land falling tropical system and a tropical depression moving through North Georgia. Stay with us, we'll break those um, impacts down a little bit more coming up. Chris, thank you. A Cobb County Board of Education member used a familiar form of protest to call attention to the deaths of inmates at Cobb County's detention center during a meeting earlier this month as uh, Joha Howard took a knee during the Pledge of Allegiance. He received support and negative emails about the gesture. Mr. Howard explains the uh, to 11 Alive's Hope Ford the reason behind all of it. Would you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? October 15th was the first time Cobb County School Board members met in person since March and the first time Dr. Jaha Howard stepped around the desk taking a knee during the pledge. I still recited those words. I mean those words when I say the end, you know, liberty and justice for all. Uh, that also means uh, the folks that tend to get forgotten about. One of the people he doesn't want forgotten, Cavell Wingo. 11 Alive Reveal investigators found the 36-year-old complained of a stomach ulcer while at the detention center and begged to be sent to the hospital. Jail staff admit they heard him complain he couldn't breathe. Wingo later died. Tragic, and there's just so many unanswered questions. And it just speaks to so much when it comes to systemic racism. Since Dr. Howard kneeled, he's received support from the community he serves, but some backlash from others. Chatter emails uh, sent out about what they feel about the event. Emails like this one, Howard says, came from a fellow board member, calling his kneeling a disgraceful act that shows how much Howard hates the USA. Howard says this gesture is quite the opposite. It was an act of love of country. Uh, when I say liberty and justice for all, just like you say liberty and justice for all, wouldn't we want to mean it? And when we see uh, injustice, we should do something about it. Dr. Howard says he doesn't know if he'll kneel again. It was just in his heart to do it that day. He does know he will continue to use his platform to call out any injustice in his community, the education and justice systems. After 11 Alive's investigation into Mr. Wingo's death, the Cobb County Sheriff's Office stopped providing jail records. To our investigators, 11 Alive then filed a lawsuit against Sheriff Neil Warren in September, claiming the sheriff violated the Georgia Open Records Act. A judge has ordered the sheriff's office to release records related to two people who have died at its detention center over the past few years, which 11 Alive just received. We have a follow-up reveal investigation this Wednesday on update about other inmates who died at the jail in 2019. New tonight, the Senate has voted 52-48. They have confirmed Amy Coney Barrett as the new justice to the U.S. Supreme Court. She is 48 years of age, and she is President Trump's justice, uh, third one to be confirmed. Judge Barrett will now give conservatives a 6-3 majority on the nation's highest court. Only one Republican senator, Susan Collins of Maine, voted against her confirmation. It occurred about 45 minutes ago, a ceremonial swearing in at the White House. I am grateful for the confidence you have expressed in me, and I pledge to you and to the American people that I will discharge my duties to the very best of my ability. Justice Clarence Thomas did honors 
at tonight's ceremony. Chief Justice John Roberts will administer an official oath. That will occur tomorrow. Tonight, the latest major poll out of Georgia showing President Trump and Joe Biden neck and neck fighting to gain an edge. 47% saying they favor Biden in the AJC poll. 46% saying they are voting for President Trump and 4% indicating they are still undecided. Another sign this could be a close one. Tomorrow, Democrat Joe Biden will become the first Democratic presidential contender to visit the state of Georgia since Bill Clinton. 11 Alive's Doug Richards is looking into the significance of his visit and where he is headed. Joe Biden will tug at the history of Warm Springs when he visits here Tuesday. It's home to the Rehabilitation Center, founded by Democrat Franklin Roosevelt 95 years ago when Roosevelt was diagnosed with polio. The 32nd president was a regular visitor and died at his cabin here in 1945. But history is only part of the story of Biden's visit. The fact that Biden is here, that he is taking his most finite resource time to come to Georgia suggests for the first time really that the Biden campaign thinks that Georgia is in the gettable category. Warm Springs is in Meriwether County. It's a Republican county, but with enough Democratic voters to keep a Democrat like Bob Trammell in the state House of Representatives. You would call my district a swing district. You would call Georgia at this point undeniably a, a swing state in the presidential uh, contest. President Trump won Meriwether County with 57 percent of the vote in 2016. But Trump got bigger vote totals in neighboring Troop, Coweta, and Pike counties. Yet Trump lost Talbot County just to the south. Trammell replaced Stacey Abrams as the House Democratic leader. Trammell says Republicans have spent a million dollars on behalf of his opponent, David Jenkins, unheard of in a state House race. I'm confident that voters see through uh, that excessively absurd expenditure. Uh, but it also communicates exactly uh, how much Georgia is really in play. And Biden stumping in mostly Republican rural Georgia may make some sense in a newly christened swing state. For Trump, Georgia is truly must win. If Biden is able to just collapse Trump's margins a little bit in rural counties, that would be a major factor. President Trump won Georgia in 2016 by about 200,000 votes. There are 2 million more registered voters in Georgia now than there were in 2016. Joe Biden's visit is coming up one day after his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, came to Georgia. She headlined a Georgia Women for Biden early voting event in Macon this afternoon and then later attended a drive-in rally in Savannah. We're now in the final week of early voting in Georgia. Record-breaking numbers continue. More than 2.9 million Georgians cast their ballot in person or by mail. We are about 25,000 votes shy of 3 million votes in our state. Nationally, 62 million people have voted early. That's more than the total number of early votes in the last presidential election. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger anticipating hundreds of thousands of more ballots that will be cast this week before early voting ends. He told voters to expect longer lines, particularly as the week winds down. He also urged voters to trust that his office is doing everything it can to protect your vote and to get a jump on counting results. They're also doing the adjudication as you're moving through the absentee ballot count. So if there's some ballots that kick out because people didn't mark them properly, they're adjudicating those right now. So we'll have a relatively timely result and get you those results a lot sooner than many other states. Secretary Raffensperger says right now all 159 counties are scanning absentee ballots ahead of time to streamline the counting process once the polls close on Election Day. The 11 Alive voting access team committed to making sure that your voice is being heard. If you have a concern you want us to address, send us an email to whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com or you can text us at 404-885-7600 and check out our voter guide. It's a good one on 11alive.com slash vote. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest. Only 6% of scouts achieve this Eagle rank status. That's according to the Boy Scouts of America. Eagle Scouts must earn 21 badges, perform community service projects, and complete an Eagle board review. It is something through the generations that has meant so much to so many. When you take a look at some of the great CEOs and, and uh, certainly warriors in the history of this country, they have all shared that Eagle Scout badge. 11 Alive's Brittany Kleinpeter spoke with two local scouts who have just earned the prestigious title, all while making history for women. The Boy Scouts program, now called Scouts BSA, began letting girls join in February of last year. But because of time requirements, it wasn't until this October that a girl could earn Eagle Scout status. I'm very proud. I'm also very relieved that I've gotten here. Lena Town is the very first female to become an Eagle Scout in her Suwannee district and joins girls across the country in becoming a part of the inaugural female Eagle Scout class. It's been a long time coming. It's been a lot of, of work and I'm so proud. Not something that we ever set out to be history making. Sometimes it just finds you where you are when you're when you're doing the right thing. Betsy Chateau of Watkinsville also joined the history making group this month and says she did face some criticism along the way. And there were some like hate from other people and people that are older than me. We kind of prepared them for it saying, OK, this is what you do if you know, this is how you respond if they say this. This is how, you know, you respond if they do that. The two Eagle Scouts have this piece of advice for other girls. Don't let any negative energy you know, put you down. It can be hard because other people will be telling you that you shouldn't be doing it, that you shouldn't be in this program. When you're done and you look back at it, it's such a satisfying thing to see all the work that has led you to where you are. And as Eagle Scouts, Lena and Betsy will join the ranks of American leaders like astronaut Neil Armstrong and President Gerald Ford. The inaugural female Eagle Scout class will include all girls earning the Eagle rank from now until February 8th of next year. We, of course, are keeping a close eye on Hurricane Zeta. This is going to be our, foca our focus this week for our forecast, as this storm is going to have impacts on us once we get into late Wednesday overnight into early on Thursday. Here's the storm right now moving in over the Yucatan Peninsula. It's going to cross over. Uh, still is a hurricane tomorrow afternoon when it's back out over water and then gaining a little more strength over the Gulf of Mexico with the winds going up to about 80 miles an hour based on this forecast. It's going to be interesting to see if that forecast changes anymore and if that wind increases or the strength increases a little bit more. This is just south of Louisiana Wednesday afternoon. We do think we'll have a landfall there along the Louisiana coastline later on Wednesday and then it becomes a tropical storm in southern Mississippi uh, overnight Wednesday into early 
early Thursday, like at two in the morning, that's the plot here. And then this is the part we have to watch going from southern Mississippi into northeast Georgia uh, between two in the morning Thursday and two in the afternoon on Thursday. So on this track here in this entire cone, the center could go up this way. The center could go down this way. But we'll, we will be feeling some impacts here early on Thursday with wind, rain and the potential for some storms uh, that will be moving through. And then by Friday afternoon, it's up just to the east of the Boston area. So that is the track of the storm uh, that we are watching. Now, we do have a hurricane watch in effect here for the Louisiana coast in the Mississippi. Tropical storm watch for the Alabama and part of the Florida panhandle. So our main threats here. Uh, rain possible that will be heavy at times two to three inches that could cause some flash flooding over North Georgia and the metro Atlanta area. We'll also be watching the storm risk at Wednesday. The storm risk is South Alabama into parts of Mississippi, the Florida Panhandle. On Friday, on Thursday, we don't have the outlook yet, but we do think that marginal risk could extend up to around Metro Atlanta. And then this is the wind risk, all right? You've got the wind with the storm coming in, making landfall late Wednesday, but then as the remnants move our way, you can see the yellow color showing 20 mile an hour winds. We'll be feeling that on Thursday morning. And then some of those higher wind gusts in the orange colors you see here, that's between 30 and 40 miles an hour. So the wind is going to be an issue with the saturated ground, we can see some trees coming down with that early on Thursday. So here's what we're watching in the outlook here. Mostly cloudy Tuesday, um, then showers and storms arriving late Wednesday into early on Thursday. We clear out for Friday and Saturday as a cold front pushes that tropical moisture out and it brings in drier air and cooler air with highs in the 60s Saturday and then Sunday and Monday just a low rain risk with high temperatures still holding in the 60s. Take a look at your weather wow moment for today and this is a beautiful picture of not only the clouds there but uh, kind of the, the nice colors and the leaves as well. This is from Jerry Bryson. Uh, Jerry is one of our 11 Alive community storm trackers. He took this at the farm and Young Harris. Thank you Jerry for sending this to us. Uh, Jerry is one of our community storm trackers, 11 Alive community storm Storm trackers. You can be one too. On Facebook, just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member of that group. We'll let you in. You can post your weather related pictures there, and you can also see what other people are posting from their neighborhood. COVID 19 is changing the way we do many things, and now it may even impact how you do your holiday shopping. Ah, yes. The hits just keep on coming. We'll explain coming up next. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. 
because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage. It is 60 days until Christmas. The coronavirus pandemic is making some presents harder to find this year. Retailers say refurbished items could help you fulfill wish lists. Here is NBC's Dan Sheneman. Wasn't long ago that refurbished or open box items got a bad rap for being shoddy secondhand items. The bar is actually much higher for, for refurbishing than it is for manufacturing. Sender Shamas is the CEO of GoTRG, a reverse logistics company that provides retailers and manufacturers a streamlined process for returned or damaged inventory. Refurbished can mean a product that was either broken or roughed up a little, but it could also mean an item someone decided they didn't want anymore. And we handle thousands of vendors and manufacturers and, and distributors. GoTRG processes over a million items each week. People think that what's bought um, in a store or online is usually ends up back on the shelf and that's the furthest thing away from the truth. Once returns hit the warehouse, turnaround time is pretty quick. Approximately seven days to process these goods. We've done in as little as three days. Like new items are then made available on the secondary market. So we have brands like VIP Outlet, the store.com. There's wholesale brands like directliquidation.com. But we sell a lot on eBay, Amazon, Walmart Marketplace. Buying a refurbished product can save money compared to buying it new. Consumers are price sensitive and they will take advantage of a deal if they find one. Giving a product a second life instead of sending it off to be recycled. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews. An update tonight on the Georgia County that may be the victim of the first ransomware attack to strike America's election infrastructure. CNN reporting that Hall County was struck by a cyber attack earlier this month. It impacted systems critical to the election, including a voter signature database and a voting precinct map. But federal investigators don't believe the attack specifically targeted election systems. A county spokeswoman told CNN they began investigating the cause immediately and, quote, the voting process for our citizens has not been impacted due to the network issues, end quote. We reached out to the Georgia Secretary of State's office, which tells us Hall County moved very quickly to paper backups to confirm voter signatures, and that kept them from any serious delays processing ballots. A spokesperson also emphasized there was no threat to the state voter registration system, saying that Cases like these are why Georgia has a decentralized election system and that uh, there simply is not a problem. Tonight, civil rights attorneys accused the city of Atlanta of delaying justice in nearly two dozen police brutality cases. Their argument is this, that Atlanta is one of the biggest cities in the country that doesn't ensure its officers leading to these long protracted court battles. And if settlements are indeed reached, taxpayers are left paying the bill. Here's Joe Henke. Outside Atlanta City Hall, civil rights attorneys gathered this morning representing dozens of victims from police brutality cases with pending civil lawsuits. And what we've seen is city council members marching in protest. We've seen elected officials coming to funerals. But what we have not seen is justice for these clients. The attorneys say in cases such as the death of Kane Rogers in 2016, the city of Atlanta fired officer James Burns for shooting Rogers, but it has delayed a civil lawsuit. The attorneys argue the problem is the city does not have insurance covering officers to cover large settlements. A city spokesman in response sent 11 Alive a statement reading, for the past several decades, the city has been self-insured, including the city's vehicles. If the city used private insurance coverage, it is doubtful that coverage would include police officers who have acted outside of city policies. City employees, including police officers, are represented by the city if they are sued as a result of actions taken in the course of their employment. Recently, the city of Louisville agreed to pay Breonna Taylor's family $12 million for her death following a botched police raid in March involving Louisville officers. A lot of cities now after George Floyd are trying to push to insure their officers and have liability coverage. How are we not leading that charge? In 2016, 92-year-old Katherine Johnston was shot and killed when Atlanta officers mistakenly served a no-knock warrant at her home. Her family's attorneys say after four years, they reached a nearly $5 million settlement with the city, and then they waited. That settlement came out of the, the taxpayers' money. They didn't have insurance. They had to pay me over time because we don't have that, we don't have a place for that. And the attorneys who spoke today said if the city started paying for private insurance to cover the actions of officers, it would not have any impact on pending lawsuits, but they want to make sure a better system is in place for any incidents in the future. The U.S. hit a harrowing record on Friday with more than 80,000 new COVID-19 cases, and that is the highest single-day leap since the country's peak in July. Here's what we know. According to the CDC, Georgia ranking fifth for total coronavirus cases in the country. Today, the Department of Public Health numbers show that there were 958 new cases reported while testing remains low. The state's peak also in mid-July. More than 4,800 cases were reported in a single day. Today, there were 18 new deaths reported. This is below our 14-day average. And August 22nd was the highest single day for deaths with more than 120 reported. With cooler weather comes a new challenge for business trying to stay open through the pandemic. Tracy A. McBeer talked to a Midtown hair salon owner who is a legend in these here parts about how he is adapting. 
You've got staff that don't know what to do. After 33 years in business. All of your stock, your color, your inventory. Steve got... Hightower says this pandemic has been the biggest challenge of his career, closing down the Steve Hightower hair salon and day spa on Lindbergh Way for more than six weeks. Rent goes on, everything else goes on. I did apply for the PPP loan, mm -hmm. but it came three weeks after I reopened. So I actually sent it back. Hightower says his clients range from six years old to 95. I specialize in fine thinning hair. I work with a lot of clients that have chemo. Presenting another challenge, how to make clients feel safe coming in. So three months ago, he changed his outdoor deck into an outdoor extension of his salon. Right now, pretty much they're coming outside and they're loving it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, in the fall, we're going to have it heated, and so they're going to continue to come. But Hightower says he ran into yet another challenge when he tried to buy outdoor heaters. Heater is the new toilet paper. I called every Home Depot in the city, every Lowe's. No one had one. I called Sam's. They had 16. I literally got in my car and drove there. By the time I got there, they only had one left. <laughs> so now they'll wrap plastic around the back deck, letting air get through while making the most of the heater they have. Hightower says every new challenge takes some new ideas and a lot of faith. I pray every day to watch over us, to watch over my clients, my staff, and we'll get through this. It's going to take a while. Hightower says business now is less than half of what it was last year at this time, and he doesn't expect that to increase until next spring. He just hopes they can stay afloat until that time. All right, let's take a look at some other headlines from Metro Atlanta. DeKalb County investigators say that two people died following a a bizarre chain of events last night. Just after 10 p.m., officers went to a wreck on I-20 East near Panola Road. When they arrived, they found a man inside his car who had been shot. Police believe when 41-year-old Jesse Dempsey was shot, his car was stopped in the middle lane of the interstate and then was hit by a car. 39-year-old Marie Floriston got out of that car and then was struck by a tractor trailer. She was killed instantly, and the man later died inside the hospital. Police have not named any suspects in connection with this shooting and this series of tragic events. Roswell police said they got arrested a man for arson after a fire at an apartment complex. His name is Perry Abakan. This is him, and he was charged on Saturday. Roswell police say that Abakan set fire to 10 of the crossings at Holcomb Bridge Apartments after an argument with people living there. He doesn't even live at the complex. He just got mad and decided to torch the place. He frequents the area, apparently. Nobody was hurt during the fire, but the damage was significant. Indicator, investigators are working to find out what caused a fire that ripped through a hotel overnight. The name of the hotel is Hotel Oyo. It's on Wesley Club Drive in Decatur. The fire started in an area that currently is being renovated. The fire did not spread to any areas where people were staying. Nobody was hurt. Well, here's the story of three young entrepreneurs who are asking for some help after the laptop that they used to run their business was stolen in the Crog Street Business District. Caitlin Ross reports the founders of Moki Pops, they just want their computer back. The Robinson siblings started Moki Pops five years ago when their mom challenged them to get off their phones and do something creative. They've sold the vegan popsicles all over Atlanta, and as their popularity grows, they hope to be picked up by a retail chain. But they say this theft sets them back. We take all forms of payment. Aya Robinson says she's learned a lot after starting Moki Pops with her brother and sister five years ago. Even though there is some beats, some twists and turns, never stop. Just keep going. But the family learned a hard lesson last weekend when thieves broke into their car and stole the MacBook Pro they used to keep the business running. I was mad because somebody was violating our own property. So, yeah, I was just mad in an emotional space. The family car was parked in the Crog Street parking garage just off the Beltline. We're hoping that somebody's connected to somebody who might have seen what happened. Amber Con Robinson says police told her four other cars were broken into on the same deck. My computer was not in plain sight, so it was underneath the seat inside of a bag. Um, so 
I don't know if they were watching me. Um, I had only left the vehicle for 10 minutes when it had happened. Amber works full time to support her kids' business and says the laptop has hundreds of files vital to their success. Some of it is backed up, but we have original files, Photoshop, Illustrator files, um, a lot of financial documents that were on the computer. While police don't have any leads yet, the family was back out selling Moki Pops today. Aya says they're not about to let the thieves win. We just all have to stay together and, you know, like, don't let anybody ruin our day. The family started a GoFundMe to try and recoup the cost of the laptop, but they say more than anything, they want their computer back so they can get their files back. A single mother who lost her job during the pandemic now facing eviction, a snapshot of the reality facing hundreds of thousands of Georgians. Another tough loss for the Falcons. Man, that, that's an understatement. Why does this stuff keep happening to them and to us? Is it a psychological issue for them, for us? <laughs> Dr. Phil, where are you tonight? Here on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live. The COVID-19 pandemic impacting everybody in different ways. Matt Pearl spent the past several months producing a new series 
called the Ripple, which puts the spotlight on those wide-reaching impacts. And one of them, the estimated hundreds of thousands of Georgians now at risk for eviction. <laughs> The best thing that brought me to Alpharetta was just the peace of mind. It was a good place for kids to run and block. I'm Danessa. I'm a single mom of three. <laughs> Aiden, Police, and Carmen. I would usually drop them off and I would keep going to work. And my job was from eight to three. It took me forever to find this position, just being a mommy and single. Hooker. I'm executive director for the Atlanta Regional Commission. Last year alone, we had 150,000 uh, eviction filings. In a good economy, in a quote-unquote normal year, our estimate is as many as 40% of regional households could be under threat of eviction if nothing is done. This is very widespread. A lot of people don't realize they see a lot of apartments uh, downtown and midtown. The predominant number of affordable units are actually out in suburban communities. It's not stopping me from having to pay my rent. I'm still under contract with my landlord. Even when December 31st comes, then when? So now I have a mounting debt, no foreseeable job, three kids. It's scary. And the worst thing that can happen is that we ignore this problem, wait for somebody else to come and solve it, find out the Calvary is not coming right away, or if at all, and then we have thousands and tens of thousands of people who might have been helped wandering the streets. I think what worries me the most is that even if the community harnesses a lot of philanthropic support, the most that we can do is still a finger in the dike. I have to show strength to them in the time of worrying. I have to let them know that everything is going to be okay, even though in my mind I'm not sure. Right now I can't breathe. Right now... Right now, my main focus is to keep the kids happy and safe. And we're waiting for the 11 p.m. advisory to come out on Hurricane Zeta. It is not out yet. It is uh, going to be coming in at any moment now. That'll update the timing and intensity forecast of this storm that is most likely moving over land right now at the Yucatan Peninsula near Cozumel and Cancun right in here. As you can see that convection now that's moving in, it just depends on whether or not the actual center has made it over land that would determine a landfall. But the Yucatan is getting a big uh, impact from this right now. Here's the storm. Max winds at 80 miles an hour moving northwest at about 13. Uh, we'll continue moving northward. I do think this is the newest one that just came in because I'm seeing a, t a different little bit of a different plot. We're now up to 85 mile an hour winds early on Wednesday morning, and then we're expecting a landfall potentially Wednesday evening with 75 mile an hour winds right here and then moving up as still a tropical storm 
Thursday morning through Alabama, moving into northwest Georgia here. So this track is shifting just a little bit here. Don't focus just on that center. Look at the entire cone here because the center could be anywhere within that cone. And then still moving through northwest Georgia during the day on Thursday and then pushing up toward the north as an area of low pressure late Thursday evening before it falls apart. So I'm going to kind of refine this uh, this uh, map for you coming up at 11 o'clock. We'll have a closer look at this, but still as a tropical storm coming into northwest Georgia, we wish that it was a little weaker than that as it moves in. That is still going to enhance our risk for some strong winds here um, on Thursday. The storm risk as well and the heavy rain that we're expecting early on Thursday as the remnants move on through. Now that is just hot off the press because I just got the alert on my phone that the advisory is in and I just showed it to you just as it was coming in. Now take a look at our almanac here today. We didn't even hit 70 degrees for high. We were at 69. Our average high for this time of year is 70. So we're actually one degree below average, but we only had a five degree range in temperatures today. This morning it was 64 and then this afternoon it was 65 degrees. Here's what we're going to be watching through the overnight hours, we're going to see a pretty good coverage of clouds around just a low risk for maybe some mist and drizzle early in the morning, but not really a huge rain chance. In fact, we're going to go within eight on the wasometer with mostly cloudy skies. I do believe that we may have a few more breaks in the clouds tomorrow, with maybe just a few peaks of sunshine here and there, and that'll help the temperatures get up to around 78 degrees. Here's what we're watching with the forecast track. You know, the center of the storm is still way down to the south on Tuesday. We're going to have mostly cloudy skies here. Once we get into Wednesday, notice a little more moisture moisture starting to move in, not necessarily an outer band of uh, Zeta, but just some of that rain feeding in. And then you see Zeta coming up here from the south and coming, coming in, inland here later on Wednesday and into Thursday. It moves up toward the north and as it moves our way, we're going to see some of those bands of heavy rain, the wind, and also the potential for some storms moving in. We're going to fine tune this forecast for you more at 11 o'clock on up late. 80% chance for rain later on Wednesday into early on Thursday with the main impacts of the remnants of Zeta early Thursday. Then it clears out late, uh, clearing skies Friday with a high of 65. Mostly sunny Saturday with a high of 65. Lows in the 40s here as we head into the weekend with low rain risk for Sunday and also on Monday. Sports on this Monday night, an Atlanta United player has tested positive for COVID-19. The team says tomorrow's training session now is out. It's over. It's been canceled. The initial positive resulted from Sunday's testing, and it was confirmed today. The team says it will conduct more tests coming up tomorrow. But their game in Orlando for Wednesday, it's still on. UGA returned from its bye week, and one of the big questions going uh, into the Kentucky game is about the quarterbacks. Stetson Bennett looked good for the first three games, but then struggled against Alabama. We saw how quickly Kirby Smart moved on from Dewan Mathis, and we're trying to figure out now what's going on with JT Daniels. But today, Coach Smart cleared things up just a little bit. He was asked if Stetson Bennett is still his guy. He responded by saying that Bennett has been taking reps with the starters. And he added this bye week was about growing and establishing continuity. However, Kirby Smart said he is always evaluating his football team. Y'all can keep asking the questions, but we're always evaluating guys at quarterback, and they're always trying to get better, growing their game. Um, Stetson's still repping with the ones, taking reps. We got other guys' reps, and that was what you do in an offer. You try to grow your team and get them better. <clears throat> but at the same time, we're trying to create continuity, trying to get better as a team and a unit. Um, and, you know, you don't base your season on one game. You base your season on what gives you the best chance to get better. Once again, the Falcons are coming off a brutal loss. ESPN's model had the Falcons with a win probability as high as 98.7% late in the game against the Lions. It ended up being the Falcons' third loss this season with a, probabil a probability of at least 98 percent, the most by a team in 20 seasons. Is it possible the Falcons' inability to close out games has become a psychological thorn, calling Dr. Phil? There's no psychological issues here. Um, there's no excuses. Uh, we have not played well um, with some of the fourth quarters, even in our win you know, versus Minnesota. I talked about wanting to finish that game better. Um, so we got to find ways to finish games better and play better at those moments. So when things go the way they have for the Falcons, man, you, all kinds of crazy rumors start to erupt. Julio Jones and Matt Ryan, could they be traded before the November 3rd deadline? National reports today say, oh, that's not true. The Falcons are not interested in doing so. 
Sunday, Julio said he is not interested in being traded, and today Matt Ryan said the very same thing. But, man, it's been that kind of season, and we still have a long way to go for this team. <laughs> it's, it's, don't want to look, don't want to think about it right now. All right, that's it for sports. We'll be right back. Or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. We are going to see mostly cloudy skies during the day Tuesday. High temperatures up to about 78 degrees. A few peaks of sun here and there. And then the rain moves in late on Wednesday. And the biggest storm risk from Zeta will be overnight Wednesday into early on Thursday, where we have to watch the potential for some not only heavy rain, flooding rain, also wind and a storm threat there. It ends late Thursday. We clear out and cool off for the end of the week and into the weekend. All right, Chris, thank you. That is it for us tonight. Thank you for watching. We appreciate it. And a reminder that Up Late Right Now commences over on 11 Alive. You can check out the very latest news, weather, and sports at 11alive.com. We have voter guides there as well. You can also figure out where you need to vote and what the situation and circumstances are as far as crowds go. Have a great night, everybody. We leave you with a closing shot of the freeway, which defines the Atlanta experience in so many ways. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. 
Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. 